Hello and welcome back to another episode of Nick Tiffany's Movie Reviews in the podcast form. Today we're jumping back in with Marvel with their latest Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. This marks the third entry into the Ant-Man cinematic universe. Um, This film, just like the previous two, is directed by Peyton Reed, who also did Bring It On at one point, Yes Man, The Breakup. Uh, You know, I remember one... There was once a time where Edgar Wright of the Cornetto trilogy, Shaun of the Dead, um, World's End, um, Hot Fuzz, Baby Driver, um, he was actually going to direct Ant-Man 1 way back in the day, um, but left because of creative differences with Marvel, you know, and obviously over time that has been a constant theme over at Marvel is directors leaving due to creative differences. Obviously you want to come in and tell your own story, but unfortunately Marvel makes sure that you tell the, uh, the larger story in the background, set up a billion films and have a little bit of time to focus on your characters. And so just kind of what I felt had happened with, uh, the latest Thor film and, and to a lesser degree, uh, Dr. Strange, um, Ant-Man, Quantumania, I would have loved to just have a movie with Scott Lang, with uh, with Hope Van Dyne, with, uh, with Janet and Hank, you know, and maybe Cassie and just the, just the five of them. I don't know, you know, each Ant-Man film we spend with, uh, with Scott and his cohorts, Michael Pena, David Desmashlin, we have uh, T.I. was in the first two movies, and I'm not going to lie. I I know I saw Ant Man and the Wasp. Um, I know I was excited for it because I'm a huge Lost fan. So Evangeline Lilly has always always had a special place in my heart. Um, so you know I feel like that movie kind of came and went. Lawrence Fishburne, Morpheus. Uh, to those who are uninitiated, he was in Ant Man Two, Ant Man and the Wasp, and he was doing an interview for a movie recently, and they asked him like, well, hey, you know. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the the Marvel Universe now, where you think you could fit in? And he's answering the questions as if he's never been in a Marvel movie. And he's like, wow, you know, I'd, I'd love to do one of those movies eventually, you know, if they called. And, but and they're like, hey, wait, weren't you in Ant-Man 2? And he's like, oh, yeah, you know what I was? You're right. I did have a little part in that. Um, and I think that mixed with the box office performances Of the latest Marvel films, you know, Black Panther was kind of, you know, I think still a cut above all of the rest of these recent releases in the last year or so. Um, But, you know, Ant-Man Quantumania struggled, just kind of like Shazam did. I don't know, the superhero fatigue is real, or maybe people are just ready for something that feels more real. So Ant-Man 3, Quantumania, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, follow Scott Lang, you know, we're picking up here post Avengers Endgame where Scott came back from the quantum realm, saved the world, helped get all the Infinity Stones back. They beat Thanos. He's been awarded Baskin Robbins, best employee of the year now. And the movie kind of starts with him reading from his best selling new novel, kind of telling, you know, watch out for the little guy, which is why you should always, you know, and, the, you know, you never count out the, the small guy, of course, you know, is the the larger meaning in all these movies. Um, And we get that. Um, So where we kind of catch up, Scott's clearly lost years um, away from everybody else when the blip had happened. You know, he was in a unique situation where he was in the quantum realm for only a few moments somehow, but, you know, five years passed in the the real world. So his daughter's older now. Um, And this time his daughter's played by Catherine Newton, um, a different actress who she was played by in Endgame, um, which, you know, again, I don't know, maybe they couldn't get a hold of the same actress. I thought the one in Endgame, she did a terrific job kind of conveying a lot of the emotions with um, with Paul Rudd, but, you know, what you fun to do. So Cassie, in her dad's absence, you know, has been studying the quantum realm. She's been studying a lot of the Pym particle science with Hank. Um, kind of in the background, you know, still played by Michael Douglas. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer plays Janet Van Dyne, who herself, you know, was recently brought back from the quantum realm after being gone for 30 years. Um, 
And you know, Cassie's, I think in the movie, she's supposed to be around 18. It's clear she's in that kind of college age. You know, it's like, all right, you know, there's a lot of screwed up stuff in the world and we need to be doing more to help. Whether it's, you know, she was getting arrested for um, protesting homeless encampments due to the blip, all sorts of stuff. And, and, you know, a lot of the movie is kind of, you know, her character is like, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, whatever atrocity there is, we always have to try something, Dad. You know, and they're just kind of bagging on, they're bagging on Ant-Man because they're like, you know, what if, what are you doing now? Um, and of course, you know, he kind of retorts like, uh, I don't know, I saved the entire world sorry, you know, if I'm kind of taking a break and finding myself, and they're like, yeah, well, you know what, you saved the world, big whoop, there's other problems out there, you know, and then Scott said himself, he's like, you know, if the Avengers call, like, I'll always answer that call, but, uh, but, you know, he's like, I really just want to spend time with my daughter, I really want to try to get back to living the life that I missed, um, and, you know, of course, his daughter sees that as, you know, you're just giving up on being a hero and doing whatever, So, of course, secretly in the background, she's had a fascination with the quantum realm. It's where she lost her grandmother. It's where her dad was for a brief bit of time. And the technology and the world behind it's fascinating. So, of course, she's going to show off a machine that she's been working on. Michelle Pfeiffer, you know, she is none too happy and neither is Paul Rudd. And, of course, things go horribly wrong. And all of them are sucked into the quantum realm, split up and scattered across this strange, strange world. Um, And so that's kind of where the root of the story and its conflicts takes place. Once they get down there, you got to find a way out. It took Michelle Pfeiffer's character 30 years to get out of there. So if there's any luck that they might escape, it's probably through her. Um, And when they're down there, it's clear that a lot of creatures and odd things down there know who Janet is. And they know her as the one who escaped. Because for years, apparently, she was a freedom fighter down there, fighting the oppression of one known by the name of Kang. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because he's been Marvel's largest teased villain since Thanos, kind of set to uh, to take over the mantle, so to speak, of the big bad in the MCU. Um, Kang, played by Jonathan Majors, made his first appearance at the end of Loki. Uh, but this is really kind of his first big introduction into the larger MCU, understanding where the Conqueror came from, why he was banished, and just truly how powerful he is. Um, So I won't go too much more into detail with the story. Obviously, there's going to be some conflict. If he's been banished there and they need to escape, they can't let him out. Um, And so a lot of the movie does revolve around these strange creatures in the quantum realm who've kind of been under the thumb of Kang's oppressive rule. And of course, Paul Rudd's care, you know, Scott's, he's like, we got to get out of here. We got to go home. This isn't our fight. Um, Who knows how long or how much time has passed in the world above. But, you know, his daughter, of course, is like, you know, dad, you can't do this. Like these people need our help, you know, like we got to help them. You know, if you don't, I will. And of course, you know, she's, you know, bless her heart. You know, she doesn't have the Ant-Man or the Wasp training that uh, that her guardians do. And so, of course, Paul Rudd is sucked into helping maybe a little bit reluctantly. Um, but in the Quantum Realm is really where you get into the, the biggest part of the script. And interestingly, Marvel's gone kind of a different direction in the last couple years. Ant-Man Quantumanium is written by a guy named Jeff Love, uh, Loveness. Um, you know, he used to write for Jimmy Kimmel, wrote a bit for the, uh, uh, the office, a lot of what he is known for, especially more recently. Um, he's one of the head writers for Rick and Morty. And if you don't know Rick and Morty, maybe you're living under a rock, maybe obscure sci-fi pop culture references and just weird stuff. Isn't your thing. Um, in which case Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is probably not going to be your thing. Um, cause this film is clearly written in favor of all the oddities in the world down there and certain things that you can kind of poke fun at or exploit maybe, you know, in this different world, we're going to have, you know, there's this character who's obsessed with asking people if they have holes because he doesn't. Um, And it's one of like, I don't know, some of the Marvel humor in the movie can work here and there. 
But in this film, it felt like a lot of it was forced in a way that maybe either the characters were not used to them speaking like, or it's just like, you know, we're trying to be funny for the sake of being funny, and we're going to be weird and obscure. Um, and so you kind of chuckle here and there, but it's also kind of like, this stuff's just wacky. Um, and after seeing the movie and reading through who wrote it and, you know, which episodes of Rick and Morty he directed, he did the Vat of Acid episode, um, Quan Hoarder, the special Rick's Morty. Um, you know, I, I think, I think he's a talented guy for sure. And there's a wheelhouse where that style of obscure comedy works. And granted, Ant-Man has always been more of a, a humorous character as far as their uh, portrayal of him in the MCU goes. But I, I don't know. I, you know, part of this movie was fun. I won't deny that. And there's a little bit of good action here and there. But there's just a lot of random, unnecessary comical bits that just kind of really pull you out of any serious moment. Um, you know, for a movie that obviously, you know, a lot of it is CGI because they're in this weird realm. Some of it looks pretty great. Um, you know, there's moving buildings. There's all sorts of odd creatures that can turn into gaseous clouds and back into liquid forms and all sorts of stuff that is done pretty well. Um, but again, it's the issue Marvel always has. It's like, okay, you could have had a really badass kind of final ending. Just like, no nonsense, this is serious, you have to round, and now you're finding out. Um, but of course, they just, like, I don't know what it is over there at Marvel, but they cannot let someone kick ass without throwing in a little quip afterwards. Like, you know what? Maybe you are a dick, but things can change. I, you know, that's kind of paraphrasing, but there are a few moments in this movie. I'm like, they use the word dick in this movie, like, five or six times and it every time they use it it just feels like i mean oh, okay like all right we get your you're, you're young and you're trying to be funny or they're like ah what if we called this guy like what if we called this badass character who's trying to kill us a dick um i don't i don't know marvel's really losing touch i think with where they started all those years ago with iron man telling a singular story about a singular character um, and it just, you know, some of these movies as time has gone on, like, I'm sorry, I don't know how we have three Ant-Man movies. I, you know, we just got a second Doctor Strange movie, a man who had one of the better solo films. Um, and it just, you know, Marvel's priorities and where they're at with crafting this universe, you know, it felt like they kind of threw Ant-Man a bone cause it's like, all right, well, we'll give you a third movie, but you have to introduce and set up essentially the next three or four years of Marvel. So in a way it's like, I know that these characters kind of got screwed because it's like, okay, well you have to serve a larger narrative purpose. Um, but I don't know. Kang was great. I thought Jonathan majors did a really great job in the movie. His villain is certainly, you know, he, he kind of brings you in with a little fragility and tries to earn your trust. And then, Oh, you know, he's, he's not such a good guy. He's not great. Um, and now there's a whole lot that's kind of left up in the air because of what this movie does in terms of setting his future up and all his variants as the conqueror. Um, you know, Jonathan majors is currently facing, um, quite a few legal issues for anything from, uh, domestic battery, um, to certain forms of abuse against former partners. Um, different women have started speaking up and, you know, it's, it doesn't look great at the point where most people who rep him have dropped him and people behind the scenes are kind of like it. Yeah, it's not totally good. So especially coming after this and Creed three, which dropped about a week after each other, um, and a huge Sundance debut, um, for, um, a couple films that he'd had it just not, not sure where they're going with this. Not sure if Marvel will just recast, wait till more information comes out. Um, but Marvel and Disney have to acknowledge, and they have um, in the last uh, couple months, Bob Iger coming back to Disney to save the company um, has expressed that, you know, they're going to be taking a lot more time and care when it comes to their Disney Plus and theatrical releases. They're going to slow down the number that they're churning out because it needs to kind of shift back to quality. And if this WGA strike that's going on right now will do anything, you know, hopefully 
it will ensure that when films come back and when we kind of continue telling these stories, obviously we want uh, we want these people to be paid. Um, and I hope that's not like a, a crazy thing for me to say because, you know, you've got the Warner Brothers Discovery executive who doesn't mention the strike at all but hopes people will choose the right thing to do eventually and come back to work and whatnot. This man's making hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, gets certain bonuses as his company is, you know, losing millions of dollars per quarter. Um, it's just, it's just kind of crazy right now. And Marvel had a few other comedy writers that they were bringing in that they have since now replaced in the last few months. I think clearly indicating they need to go bigger. And Blade, which should be a rated R vampire killer movie for some reason was going to be PG 13, but production on that's kind of been shaky because they've been having to rewrite. I think there have been issues where, okay, we're seeing a lot of this stuff isn't landing anymore. This needs to be a, a serious tale. First it needs to be a serious story. Um, and if the story calls for it, I'm like, it's gotta be rated R Deadpool's gotta be rated R Logan. Thank God it was rated R. A Blade movie needs to be rated R. You're full, like, if you're going to have vampires, blood suckers, silver bullets, and all that jazz, you can't make that PG-13. That's what we expect of Marvel. And, you know, if it's anything like what we expect, like what we've been getting, it's not going to be great. So, I guess the long short of it, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, it was an enjoyable time at the theater, but it didn't do a whole lot for me. Um, you know, even the ending, um, which... I'm just going to say spoiler alert now, so I'm going to wrap this up with this spoiler, and then we'll end it. So if you haven't seen it yet, thanks for listening. Watch it and let me know what you think. But if you have seen it, spoiler coming at you in three, two, one. The original script, or one of the original scripts for this movie, was going to end up with either uh, Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer getting trapped in the quantum realm, or... Late in the game, it kind of changed, and it's like, okay, it's going to be Paul Rudd trapped there in the quantum realm. You know, maybe it was too bad that Michelle Pfeiffer had been stuck there all along, and they're like, okay, maybe it'd be more impactful if we left Ant-Man. Because everyone was kind of talking like, Ant-Man might die in this movie. And if he did, that'd be kind of like, I don't know, maybe I'd be more interested in it then, because it actually has consequences. But the way this movie ends is you beat the bad guy, but oh damn, we got stuck. But Evangeline Lilly makes a sacrifice to keep Kang out of this world or out of our world to keep Scott's daughter safe with her parents. And now she and her love are trapped in the quantum realm. And I was like, okay, if that's where this is ending right now with the two of them, yeah, it sucks they're going to be there for a while, but at least they have each other. Because these are two characters that we've hardly gotten to see interact with one another um, who are supposed to be in this relationship and have this deeper connection. Um, and so it's like, okay, that could be an interesting place to leave them for a future story or whatever. But no, they're there for all of 30 seconds before it's like, all right, babe, it's time to go home. And then the portal opens up again and they go home. And everybody's happy and everything's fine. And for the most part, we save the day. And I don't know. I like To me, it is the essence of poor storytelling or just not knowing how to succinctly wrap up a story in a way that feels like you've earned, you know, like these characters have earned a win, whether it comes at the ultimate cost, because that is what being a hero is. Sometimes you have to make these savior moments that don't benefit you, but they're going to benefit everyone else that you love and care about. Um, and so I just, you know, coming out of the movie, I was like, fuck, I wish... I wish that they had done something like that. I wish they would have kept with it instead of just trying to make more jokes afterwards. But, you know, that's a lot to ask for a movie that, you know, had Modoc and turned him into what they did. But I digress. Thanks again for listening, guys. <laughs> this is longer than I thought I was going to talk about Ant-Man. But we'll catch you next time with some non-comic uh, non book reviews. Thanks, guys.